Hi everyone and welcome back to GISC 125 Mapping and Spatial Thinking and today we're going to talk about location, distance, direction, and scale. So above all else, geography is considered a spatial science and it is concerned with the spatial behavior of people, with the spatial relationships that are observed between places on the Earth's surface, and with the spatial processes that create or maintain those behaviors and relationships. So geographers are concerned with the intersection between space, which is the physical gap or distance between two objects, and place, which is a specific point on the earth with human and physical characteristics that distinguish it from other places. So location is probably one of the most significant aspects of the discipline, which is position of an object that could be put on a map. That location doesn't need to be on Earth's surface. It can be below, it can be within the oceans, the atmosphere, or even in space. So where are you right now? The answer to this question will obviously depend on your location, but it will also depend on how you decide to describe where you are. Are you at home? If so, you may wish to describe your location with an address. Are you at school? If so, you would likely use the name of the building, such as the Nampa Campus Academic Building, to define where you are. Perhaps you're at a coffee shop, which will lead you to use the name of the place, such as Starbucks. However, say you are <clears throat> filling out an online survey for a local retail store that would like to know the general vicinity in which you live. In such case, you would likely be asked to provide your zip code that identifies the section of your city, town, or rural area that you reside. Finally, when creating your profile on social networking sites such as Facebook, you explain your location by entering your city and count country uh, where you're located, which are descriptors commonly referred to as place names. So geographers can describe the location of a place in one of two ways, either absolute or relative. Absolute location describes the location of a place based on a fixed point on Earth. So the most common way is to identify the location using coordinates, such as your latitude and longitude. <clears throat> relative location is the location of something relative to other features. For example, the location of the U.S. Capitol is located about 38 miles southwest of Baltimore. So relative location can be expressed in terms of distance, travel time, or cost. So absolute loc location versus relative location. So the concept of direction has always served a great importance in society and spatial thinking. So direction is used to determine where things are in relationship to other things. For example, humans lived in hunt and gatherer societies required a keen sense of direction in order to bring food back to their groups. Direction was critical in the days of global exploration when Christopher Columbus and other explorers were attempting to locate quote-unquote undiscovered lands across the ocean. Today we are like, less likely aware of direction because we have devices that provide this information or this knowledge for us. We don't need to think which way is west because the GPS receiver in our cars or the mapping app on our phones tell us how to get there. While some may argue that digital technologies have made us lose our sense of direction, it can also be said that digital technologies can help us better understand it. So another important component of spatial thinking is distance. So in general, there are two ways in which we describe distance, relative and absolute. Relative distance is the way in which most of the kind of discussed distance in our, in our daily lives. We use the terms such as close to, near, far, short, and long to describe the proximity of two locations from one another. These terms are, of course, are ambiguous because what far means to one person could mean something different to another. For example, if you commute over an hour to get to school every day, your concept of far is likely different than someone who can walk to school in 10 minutes. Nonetheless, kind of relative terminology is extremely useful for most of us when we kind of communicate.
Absolute distance is specific measurements between two locations. So it is the measurement you receive when you ask your mapping app to provide you with the directions from one location to another. So in general, distances are provided to you either in metric or empirical units. So between one location and another, it is 10 miles. That would be absolute distance. So there are two concepts of scale that are fundamental to geography. There is something called cartographic scale and analysis scale. So cartographic scale can be expressed in three ways. Verbal scale, for example, one inch equals one mile on the map. Representative fraction, which could be one inch on the map is equal to 62,500 inches on the Earth's surface. And a rep uh, representative fraction doesn't have any units associated with it. So it can be anything uh, as long as they're the same. One mile on the map is equal to 62,500 miles on the Earth's surface. So it's unitless. And the other is just the um, geographic scale bar, which we're all familiar with. So these are cartographic scales. Um, cartographic scale can also be concerned with the scale of the map. And so, for example, large scale maps show a small area, but it shows it in great detail. And that's shown here on the uh, left side. So as you can see, we can see the cities, we can see the buildings, we can see kind of smaller roads, while a small scale map shown on the right shows a greater geographic area, but with much less detail. So as we can see, um, we can't see the, the smaller roads, we can see a much bigger area, um, we can't see the buildings and so forth. So it's a little counterintuitive. So large scale maps show a smaller area, but more detail. And a small cartographic scale map shows a larger area with less detail. So as we begin to see that how we understand the world is dependent on our scale of observation. And this is kind of the analysis of scale. So depending on the scale at which you look at a geographic pattern, you can drive completely different results from the exact same underlying data. This is why the analysis of scale is so important. So this map displays the median household income for the United States at the state level. So what do you notice about the spatial distribution of income at the scale of the entire um, country? One predominant observation is that California, Virginia, and New York are locations where relatively high household income are, and states such as New Mexico, Mississippi, Alabama have relatively low household incomes. So what happens when you change the scale of your observation to the county level. So the spatial distribution of household income changes and it kind of changes uh, dramatically. So you should note that income is not evenly distributed across the city or the state. In fact, many counties display some of the form of clustered patterns of income where low income households are clustered in one area while relatively high income households are clustered in other areas. For example, it is the coastal counties in California that have relatively high household income than northern or central California. Also, we saw that New Mexico had a relatively low household income at the state level, but we see several counties with a high household income. Why is this? So this is due to Los Alamos National Lab, and there's also a university in another, in another county. So it is evident from this example that we can't necessarily transfer our observations about the world at one scale, in this example for the states, to another, the counties. So your scale or your analysis of scale is important.